in the part 2 of this lecture, we'll take a deeper look at the oxygen binding curve. So the shape of the oxygen binding curve or the oxygen saturation curve is influenced by two factors, which are the level of carbon dioxide and the level of pH. So when we have increased metabolism, we generate more carbon dioxide. And that also means we need more oxygen. As a result, the oxygen binding curve shifts towards right hand side so that more oxygen can be released at any given PO2 level. For information, when the curve shifts towards right hand side, it favors oxygen release or oxygen dissociation. While when the curve shifts towards left hand side, it favors oxygen binding or oxygen loading. Similarly, with increased metabolism, the pH level is going to drop as you produce more pyruvate acid or lactic acid in the case of anaerobic respiration. So the pH or the low pH actually serves as a signal for increased oxygen demand. And with that, the oxygen binding curve shifts to right, towards right hand side to release even more oxygen. So to summarize, both an increase in the PCO2 and the decrease in pH shift oxygen curve towards right hand side. And that is to release more oxygen at any given PO2 level. And now let's look at the mechanism by which PCO2 and pH levels have effects on your oxygen saturation curves. So because the hemoglobin are within the red blood cells, so this mechanism does involve your red blood cells. And with increased cellular respiration or metabolism during exercise, that gives rise to a higher level of CO2 and acids. So because carbon dioxide has a high solubility in plasma, it is going to diffuse into your red blood cells. And under the action of the enzyme carbonic anhydrase, the CO2 will be converted into H2CO3, which is the carbonic acid. And it is a weak acid, like the lactic acid or pyruvate acid that dissociates partially to release the protons. So these protons could then displace the oxygen in the oxygenated hemoglobin, producing the protonated hemoglobin, HHP. So when this happens, oxygen is released or displaced from the hemoglobin. So this phenomenon is known as the Bohr effect, which states that the oxygen binding affinity of the hemoglobin is inversely related to both acidity and the concentration of carbon dioxide in the blood. So the trigger here is an increased proton level. It could be proton release from the carbonic acid dissociation or it could be proton release from other acids such as lactic acid or even pyruvate acid which are both the products of increased metabolism. Aside from CO2 and pH level, temperature is another factor that can modify the oxygen saturation curve. So during exercise, our body temperature could increase higher than usual. That shifts the curve towards right hand side, promoting oxygen release. But when the temperature is cooler, we undergo less metabolism and the curve shifts towards left hand side, promoting oxygen binding or oxygen loading. So this happens more commonly for hibernating animals that reduce their body temperature and metabolic rates during winter. And the one last factor we're going to discuss in this lecture is 2,3-DPG or 2 3 diphosphoglycerate. So you have learned that red blood cells have no mitochondria and the only way they can obtain energy is by running glycolysis. And this 2,3-DPG is an intermediate substrate within the glycolytic pathway. So what happens is that the binding of 2,3-DPG on the hemoglobin, specifically allosteric site, will promote the release of oxygen. In other words, it pushes the curve towards right hand side. And conversely, with little or no 2 3 dpg that pushes the curve towards left hand side, which favors oxygen binding or oxygen loading. So for a blood sample that has little or no 2 3 dpg it will have a very high affinity towards oxygen, meaning that it can bind to oxygen very easily, but it will hardly release any oxygen. So we'll come back to that later. Okay, here are the 10 steps of glycolysis. And it is over here. You have the 1,3-BPG or 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. 
which is also known as 1,3-DPG by the physiologists. So physiologists tend to call them DPG, but I myself and the biochemists, we tend to call it BPG. And guess what? Biochemists are being more accurate because the reason we call it a BPG, a bisphosphate, is that you can see how these phosphate groups are separated. Well, in the case of diphosphate, it means they must be side to side, such as in the case of ADP. Anyway, you will see that this 1,3-DBG will be converted into 2,3-DBG by the enzyme within our red blood cells. So with increased glycolysis or with increased metabolism, you have more 2,3-DBG production, and that shifts the oxygen binding curve towards right-hand side, and that will trigger more oxygen release from red blood cells. On the other hand, the production of 2,3-DBG also increases when oxygen delivery to the peripheral tissue is diminish or reduce. That could happen during chronic lung disease when the overall ventilation efficiency is compromised or it could happen with anemia when you have got less erythrocytes or during congestive heart failure when oxygen supply is reduced due to thrombosis or at a high altitude as you have less PO2 level. So your red blood cells under these conditions will respond by producing more 2,3 DPG so that the oxygen binding curve will be shifted towards our hand side. And with that, you could have better oxygen supply to these tissues or else these tissues could suffer a condition known as hypoxia and eventually die off. Okay, this is what I mentioned just now. If you store a blood sample for too long, eventually the 2,3 DPG level is going to decrease and at about 21 days, it is essentially zero. And that moves the oxygen curve towards right or left hand side. Yes, it is the left hand side. In other words, the HB now or the hemoglobin now has a very high affinity towards oxygen, but it will hardly release any oxygen molecule. So even now the patient has received a blood transfusion, but due to this low level of 2,3 DPG from this old blood sample, the patient is not going to get any extra oxygen supply. But eventually, the level of 2,3-DBG will climb up after some time. Okay, here is a question to test your understanding. You may pause the video for a moment. And the answer is A, left-hand side. As I mentioned before, HBF will require a higher oxygen affinity to extract oxygen from her mother's blood. And to achieve that, the oxygen binding curve must be shifted towards left-hand side. So you have learned before that fetus has another form of hemoglobin, which is HBF or the fetal hemoglobin that consists of two alpha chains and two gamma chains. Usually you can find the fetal hemoglobin from two months of gestation to around six months after birth. And eventually almost all of the fetal hemoglobin will be replaced by the HBA or the adult variant of hemoglobin, which consists of two alpha chains and two beta chains. So we need the fetal hemoglobin because it has a higher affinity for oxygen than the maternal hemoglobin. Now, if you look at this chart, the fetal hemoglobin is almost fully saturated at 40 millimeter of PO2 level, while the maternal hemoglobin is only 75% saturated. It means that a portion of oxygen must be released from the maternal blood and it will be captured by the fetal hemoglobin. So half of the fetal hemoglobin is dissociated at about 90 millimeter of hemoglobin or 90 millimeter of PO2 level, while the same is about 27 millimeter for the maternal hemoglobin. So in other words, fetus always get sufficient oxygen supply, even though its oxygen partial pressure might be lower than her mom. And one more thing is that fetal hemoglobin is not affected by the binding of 2,3-DPG. That's because one amino acid on the gamma subunits of the HBF is mutated. So it does not really bind onto this substrate. So overall, fetal hemoglobin provides an efficient gas exchange between the mother's blood and the fetus blood, and from fetus blood to fetal tissues. And now we have come to the final section of this lecture.
we will talk about the transport of carbon dioxide across our bloodstream. Basically, carbon dioxide can be transported in three ways. It could either dissolve in the plasma, or it can be bound to the hemoglobin. And last but not least, it can be transported as the bicarbonate ions within the plasma. So roughly 7% of carbon dioxide is dissolved in the plasma. And that's because carbon dioxide has a high solubility in water. Or even more, which is 23% of carbon dioxide is transported by the hemoglobin. So when the dissolved carbon dioxide diffuse into red blood cells, they can bind to hemoglobin, forming the carbamino hemoglobin molecule. And this process is reversible. But most of the carbon dioxide is transported in the forms of bicarbonate ions, and that consists of 70% of carbon dioxide. So this reaction is an enzyme dependent step because we will need carbonate anhydrase to combine both carbon dioxide and water into carbonic acid. And this is the weak acid that will dissociate partially into bicarbonate ions and protons. And then the bicarbonate ions will exit the red blood cells in exchange for the chloride ions to maintain the charges. And this process is known as the chloride shift. So the formation of bicarbonate ions is a reversible step depending on the gradient of carbon dioxide. At tissue, where you have a high carbon dioxide level, the reaction is going right hand side, forming more carbonic acid and bicarbonate ions. But in your lungs, where you have a lower CO2 level, that reaction is going left hand side, breaking carbonic acid back into carbon dioxide and water molecules. And that forms a large portion of water vapor in your breath. And here is one more property of the hemoglobin. When it is deoxygenated, it has a greater affinity for carbon dioxide than the oxygenated hemoglobin. So what is the importance of this property? Well, it means that the deoxygenated hemoglobin can carry more carbon dioxide back to lungs for exhalation. And now let's come back to the underwater keys. Assuming that this couple had perfect mouth-to-mouth -mouth transfer, what are the possible tricks you can help them to extend their time underwater? So I'll leave it to you and we shall discuss this in my next lecture. To summarize, we have talked about the transport of oxygen from alveoli to the tissues and the transfer of carbon dioxide from tissues to alveoli. And now you may pause the video for a while to complete these questions. So have you got the answers? Most of the oxygen is transported by what? Yes, hemoglobin. And most of the carbon dioxide is transported in the form of bicarbonate ions that are formed by the combination of carbon dioxide and water under the enzymatic action of carbonic anhydrase. And the oxygen binding affinity of the hemoglobin can be modified by four factors, which are the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, PCO2 level, pH, temperature, and 2,3 dpg.